Okay, so good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Civil Engineering Blended Learning Showcase. It's great to see so many faces here today. Um, so just before we get into the short presentations, uh, I thought it was worth uh, highlighting um, uh, a, a couple of things. There tends to be a lot of confusion around blended learning and what it is and where it's come from and what it means. And this is a screenshot here of uh, the curriculum management system. Uh, that we've all used for a long time. It's where we populate our module descriptor. And uh, the, the idea of uh, blended learning and online learning and face-to-face -face learning has been around for a very, very long time. We would have chosen this from a drop-down menu. Uh, and for most of us, the norm for years and years was this face-to-face -face learning. Uh, but there has always been the option uh, for, for blended and for online. Um, and I suppose what our ex collective experience has been recently is that we had to flip from this totally face-to-face -face online learning, oh, sorry, face-to-face -face learning to a totally 100% online learning when the pandemic hit. Um, and because we as engineers love a Venn diagram, I thought it was an appropriate way to, to explain blended learning a little bit more. So the, the blended learning is this space in the middle where we decide to keep those, those things that worked really well face to face, to keep doing them face to face. And those things that, that actually turned out to work a little bit better in the online environment, that we keep those. And then that is our blended module, our blended learning. Uh, I was looking for a Venn diagram on Google this morning that would give me a really tiny overlap rather than a large overlap. Uh, the idea there being that we could be predominantly face-to-face -face with a tiny sliver of something that was online. And that is still uh, blended learning. Uh, but, but alas, Google uh, didn't sort me out. Um, I did find this other one though, um, which I thought was worth mentioning, uh, this idea that the, you know, the in-person face-to-face classroom lecture uh, is, is a synchronous experience for students. Everybody's there together at the same time. The opportunity with the online learning or the e-learning is that it may happen in a synchronous way or an asynchronous way. Students can be doing it in their own time. Um, but having a little bit of both or a lot of one and a little of the other is still a blended learning experience. So without further ado, um, this is our uh, uh, agenda for today's session. Um, so, so these are colleagues uh, affiliated with the School of Civil Engineering who have uh, found elements of online learning that worked for them, that they are choosing to keep uh, going forward. Um, so that while predominantly they may be in a face-to-face -face learning environment, uh, th these are elements that worked better online that they would like to keep uh, going forward. Um, so uh, at this point, I will uh, uh, introduce Dr. Sarah Cottrell, our, our first speaker. And, and she's going to talk a little bit this morning about the virtual field trips that she um, has prepared and some of the lab videos that she's been using. Um, it has occurred to me that when I shared screen that I forgot to share sound and share audio. <laughs> so bear with me just a second. Uh, I, I will stop the screen share and start it again with audio. Uh, so, so hopefully that won't have been too much of a disruption. Uh, so over to you, Sarah. Jen, uh, so just a little bit of um, context on why I decided to develop some of these uh, materials. Um, I wanted to create some tools that would help to reduce the amount of time that students needed to be in the lab or on site. So part of the reason for developing these virtual labs and these virtual field trips were kind of... Um, useful in the pandemic, but the idea for them had actually come before we even knew what COVID was. And my idea for developing these things was about saving time and creating more opportunities uh, within the constraints that we, we often find ourselves in. 
Uh, so I'd come up with this idea of creating some virtual labs and some virtual field trips in 2019, and then it just happened to coincide with, uh, with everything that was going on. Uh, so the, the main thing I wanted them to be was time efficient. So creating tools that might be used as a precursor to a lab, maybe cutting down on that amount of time that the demonstrator or the lecturer has to be there at the beginning explaining uh, procedures, but also things that might explain how various bits of equipment work. So it might be used in an undergraduate or a postgraduate lab, or it may be used with uh, masters or PhD projects to explain key bits of equipment. So you don't have to go in and show them over and over again how it works, that you can share these materials and, and that's time efficient uh, for you and for them that they can they can rewatch it as and when they need to uh, to figure out how that works. Um, I wanted to increase uh, the number of practical sessions they could engage with. So um, depending on uh, the uh, size of the class that we want to take in, or the size of the lab facility that we have, we are constrained in the amount of uh, practical time from a timetabling perspective, from a resource perspective. And so I thought if some of the labs were created in a, an online approach, then they could still have some elements that they could do in the laboratory where they're learning the practical skills, but there might be other things that they could do in a virtual way uh, where they're still getting the, uh, the, uh, the analysis and the data interpretation side of things that they might get from a lab report um, without actually physically being in the lab. Um, I wanted these tools to be supportive. I wanted to provide resources that students could uh, revisit and reinforce their learning. So quite often um, students can have anxiety or, or concerns about going into a lab and not know what they're doing, particularly when it's their first time in a lab. And so watching these videos before um, or even after the lab would uh, remind them what they'd done within that lab um, and, and help them with any reports or, or um, processes that they might need to do uh, later. And finally, I wanted them to be accessible. So one of the modules that I teach is taught uh, to an in-person cohort, but also online. And so by creating these online uh, virtual labs, it meant that we could enable practical sessions for these distance learners who may never ever set foot on UCD's campus, that they could still kind of have that uh, partial experience of being uh, in UCD's uh, laboratory. So if we can just uh, go on to the next slide. So some of the different things that I uh, developed were kind of demonstration of analytical techniques or so something like how to use a pipette or a pH probe. Um, and we've got an example of this uh, later on. Um, some of them were interactive digital labs. So for example, we would show the procedure that you would go through if you were in the lab doing that yourself. And then the data would be presented either in the video or in a, an accompanying workbook so that the students could then work through the analysis. So this might be enumerating bacteria where photographs or, or animations of the, uh, the plate counts that could be done at the end would be shown. Uh, determining water hardness through titration. So the process of that is shown and then you can actually read the measurements uh, from the video and the photograph stills that are taken from that. Um, and calculating bio biochemical oxygen demand, which again uh, was, was done as an animation. Uh, so if we just go into the next slide. Uh, so if we just play the video here, this just shows... The basic principle of how a pipette works is simple. When the plunger is depressed, air is displaced from inside, creating a pressure drop, which allows water to be drawn in. Nearly all pipettes have two stops on the plunger. It's a good idea to check you can feel these two different stops before you start pipetting. When you are confident using the two buttons, you need to put a tip on the pipette. First, make sure you have the correct size and then open the tip box and place the end of the pipette into one tip. Press down gently but firmly. Then take away the pipette and the tip should come with it. So that short clip there just shows um, an example of an instructional video. And what you can see here is that there's no talking to the camera. All of it is done as a voiceover. And this is shown to explain to people how to use equipment within the lab. Um, it's an, it much easier to, to edit video in terms of uh, you're not trying to film someone face on. And so you probably have to, to shoot less things. And Mairead can give a lot more advice on this than I can. Uh, but what we see within this is that there's two different types of um, a technique used within this. So the voiceover is consistent throughout, but we have somewhere we have live footage showing the pipette in action. And then we also have um, a short animation that was uh, created by Kevin Nolan, who um, helped me out on this to be able to, to show uh, closer up than I would be able to show with the physical pipette, 
how that pipette is moving. So we can use different techniques within this to be able to explain how to use some of the equipment within the lab and create a very short video to explain that. So this is a 30 second clip of a, of a two minute video that would explain that process to students. We can just move on to the next slide. And we also created some videos of physical demonstrations of lab facilities, so um, how the rainfall simulator might work, and that might be used to support theory within lecture material, or it could also be used for research students ahead of them using that equipment down the line. And uh, the final thing that I just want to show a video clip of is of a virtual site tour. So I went to a wastewater treatment works and filmed uh, a site tour with an operator there. And the point in this was to um, allow the students to actually see the processes that we talk about in the theory without having to take them all to the site. So uh, it might be that we teach them about water treatment works, wastewater treatment work, constructed wetlands, um, the sewer network itself and pumping stations. And it's unrealistic to assume that we can take students to all of these different um, uh, assets and facilities. And so it might be that we use a blended approach that we can take them to one of these facilities, but maybe we can have video tours of the other ones. So I'll just show a very quick clip of this now. Centrifuge in the background, John, this big brown container. Basically, that's a little tumble dryer that tumble dries the sludge. Polymer is added to it just to reiterate, and it gets, helps to make a flock, which is a separation of the water. So it spins very quickly to get the water out dries it as it goes along the heat of the machine dries into dry product yeah and it comes up these chutes here and drops into this hopper here and then this in turn screw hopper pulls it up into this hole and tank here basically that is a huge hopper and inside there you can get 50 ton of dry product So um, that's all I really wanted to show today. So it's just different examples of the types of videos that can be made and the wide variety of uses that they can be um, used for to support students. That's fantastic, Sarah. Thank you so much. Uh, what I might suggest is that uh, though we might save questions and answers for a little bit later in the, in the name of getting through the various uh, little present presentations. Uh, but, but by all means, if, if people have questions to, to pop them into chat um, and, and we can have a, a, a simultaneous conversation going there. Uh, so so um, our next presenter uh, this morning is uh, Philip. Uh, so Philip is going to talk a little bit about his use of um, Miro for digital workshops and also how he's used podcasts as a form of assessment. Uh, so without further ado, Philip, I'll hand over to you. OK, thanks, Jen. Um, I'm just laughing at that photograph. It's about 12 years old at this, at least 12 years old at this stage. I must update it. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, Jen, for organising this. I, as Jen says, I'm going to talk about two things. Um, the first one is very simple, and I'm sure lots of people are using this tool. Um, the, this tool is Miro. There's another one called Mural, which is really irritating that they've both got similar names, but they're both basically online whiteboards. And they're extremely effective for getting students all in one space online, contributing information and navigating information spatially. So Jen, I was actually, the, the only way to sort of demonstrate it is to go into it. So I will have to share my screen if that's okay. So I was going to show you two examples. Now, yeah, I should just mention that I, I use a Miro app that I didn't find. Miro offered it to me somehow magically and I literally just clicked a button and the, and the app appeared. And the really useful thing about the app is that I find that I'm invited to loads of different Miro boards in different projects. And then if you want to go back to that board, it's an absolute pain trying to find it. But what the app does is anytime you go onto a Miro board, it collects that board into the app without you having to do anything. So it's very effective in making things extremely simple. So this first example, is a whiteboard that I've used for a series of workshops with a master's group that Oliver Canan and myself operate um, and run, coordinate. Um, and initially in 2020, 2021, 
this group obviously weren't meeting <clears throat> and we were running these cafes to basically build capacity with the students. They were from all over the world and they weren't meeting each other. And we wanted to build capacity in the class. And what you're seeing here is a whole series of different cafes. So there's one up the top. If you can see my cursor, can you see my cursor moving? No. Yep. Yeah. So this one up the top was just for people to tell tell us tell each other something about themselves. This one was starting to develop um, information about climate change impacts, etc., in their home cities. And then a series of simple exercises that are sort of building their skills in terms of reading journals and reading different art, um, different journal articles, um, and doing some journal surfing. And then all of this is in preparation for a third trimester project that they have, which is a thesis, and it's trying to build up conversations with them about what they might do for their thesis. So I, I can just zoom in here, and you see the first workshop. So they contributed, they, I gave them each a, a space to contribute. Um, so if we zoom into Bernadette here, that she told us about her interests and her experience, and then she chose us a place that she would develop in the next workshop that was important to her. And she's Hungarian and lives in Cavan, so she wanted to talk about rural Ireland. So the, the online um, conversation, which was on Zoom, was much easier because you could navigate this actual information that they could actually see it it was wasn't just an oral experience and it's also so that's synchronous but there's also an asynchronous aspect to it that they can come back and add more information to it um, so the next cafe they started giving information about challenges and solutions uh, for different places so one of the students is from Kerala in India, and he's, he could tell us all about that. And then there's another student from Chennai. And again, it's visual, it's recorded, it's something they can go back to, um, and they, I can see them all working at it and contribute, contributing to it before or during the class, and they can add all sorts of media. And then we got into all these different exercises where they assessed different sources of information, were they reliable or not, and um, they looked at different journals, and then a fifth one, they, they did some journal surfing. So I find it extremely useful, the students like it, because they can come back to it, and it's very visual. Um, it can also be used in class, so as an example here, I'm able to put the mirror board up on the screen in class and they contribute to it in the class and it's a way of everybody being able to see each other's work and go through it in a, in a spatial manner, essentially. Um, I was going to show another example of um, the use of Miro. Um, I have set up with um, Orla Murphy in architecture a thing called Centre for Irish Towns. Um, and Centre for Irish Towns has set up a collaboration with Scotland, with the University of Edinburgh. And this is just an example of one of the workshops we've run where we were trying to get people from different disciplines and also from different sectors. So there were people from communities and local authorities in Scotland and Ireland at this particular workshop. And we were trying to develop areas for research. And so myself and a colleague in the University of Edinburgh set up this template. So a lot of the time, it, in terms of running a workshop or running a class, it's about setting up the template spatially so that people can logically move through different stages. So in this one, we set up this rather colorful, I'll just zoom out to show you, there were quite a few of them. So people were divided into different groups under different themes. And so if we just zoom into this one, because this is the one that I facilitated, so I know it better. So the theme of this one, which we called a destination, was climate resilient places. And this was all decided in advance. Um, so it was asking, in what ways can our often old and historic towns adapt and transform to allow them to respond to the challenges created by the developing climate emergency? And we just asked um, the participants who are in a group to break that down into different topics that were of interest to them. So in this one, we had people who were interested in vacancy and embodied carbon, a group that was interested in fluvial flooding and how that was related to land use um, further upstream. And this was in Scotland in a place called Hoyk, um, all the lands owned by the Duke of Buccleuch, apparently. Um, and then another group was interested in um, hydrokinetic micro um, renewables. 
um, on the on the river. And we then developed this: um, what research questions might you ask? And so that all of them started developing research questions. What methods might you use to investigate those questions? Who would you need to be involved? So, for the hydrokinetic one, all these different entities in Ireland and in Scotland, the whole idea being, can we collaborate and learn from one another? And then where would you do it? And um, so in terms of hydrokinetic, there's a lot going on in Limerick at the moment. Um, and this town, that's Hoik, spelled Howick. Um, there's a lot going on there as well. So it worked extremely well. And what we're doing is Basically, we're going to create one pagers from this and use those as sort of start starters for conversations to try and bring different people in. Um, and certainly if anyone on the call is interested in hydrokinetic energy in medium sized towns in Ireland and Scotland, please uh, get in touch because that's what we're hoping to look at. OK, so that I hope demonstrates my use of Miro. I mean, it's pretty messy. It's a little bit like showing you um, the spare bedroom it's sort of got lots of stuff in it but it's a really useful i find it an absolutely invaluable tool I, I it's one of those things you can't imagine how you do anything without it and um, but it just works particularly well for the type of work that i'm doing with students but also with um colleagues so i'm going to stop sharing and do you want to put the slides up again jen thanks so the, the second um tool that I'm going to talk about um, was using podcasts as an assessment. Um, I was asked to be on a podcast. I'm sure lots of people have been in loads of podcasts, but this was a new experience for me at the end of 2020. Um, and I, the Heritage Council organised it. And I noticed that it was extremely well structured. It involved quite a bit of work. It had to be really thought through, um, but that it was a very informative, very interesting way of communicating information. So I wondered if it would be a useful thing for students. Would they be able to do that? So if we go to the next slide, um, I find online that there were there's quite a lot of support. So I set up a a um, podcast assignment a set for assessment on a course called Carbon Management and Sustainable Urbanism at master's level, and. So I set them assignment that was related to the 100 resilient cities. They basically had to choose a city from 100 resilient cities. Um, there are plenty of them and they were a fairly small class. So in the next slide, the, um, the overview, it was basically to produce a, a podcast episode that described one of those cities. And it was to a general audience, not a specialized audience. So in the next slide, I think I have the Oh yeah, the learning outcomes. So it was really about being able to bring lots of different pieces of information together, make it legible, and um, to communicate it um, without using visual aids. A lot of the students on this um, masters would be from an architectural background, and if you put an architect um, up in front of an audience and they don't have any visual aids, they can be quite lost. They, 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 where are my slides? So it actually, I thought it was probably going to be quite a challenging thing for them to do. So they were to work in groups. Um, I think there may be about five in a group and they had to assign, there's lots of different tasks. So they had to assign different responsibilities. Um, they had to include information that they'd learned from the lectures, which were about urban resilience and that specific city that they'd chosen. And they were allowed to bring in lots of different media. And um, so they could bring in recordings of somebody else that they might have found online and they could bring in um, music and sound effects. And there's the most amazing amount of stuff when you start looking online. So in the next slide, this is just all from my brief that I gave them. So they had to you know, record the podcast. I really wasn't sure how they were going to get on. Certainly if you asked me to do a podcast in three weeks, I'd probably have a panic attack. But they also had to put in the text document because you, you do have to write out what you're going to say. This is a, you know, it is a rehearsed, it is a well um, developed piece of communication. So it's not that you're going to just start talking. So they submitted what their, their script was with an annotated bibliography. Um, and I gave them a whole lot of guidance. So I just took a, an afternoon and found masses of stuff online. So there, there is a huge amount of stuff online um, for that. Um, so 
Jen, again, I I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm going to try and play a very short excerpt um, from one of the the classes. Now, this may not work, so I apologise in advance. So I I'll need to share screen. Funnily enough, to do this, um, if you just bear with me. Oh, it started somewhere on my computer, but you can't hear it. That's because I have to share this. Hang on a sec. I hope this will work. Okay, so I, I, don't worry, I'm not going to go very far into it, but nod if you can hear it, please. We recognize that the storms didn't cause all of our problems. It just made that which we had either much, much better or much, much worse. They put a magnifying glass on it and, it and it really showed us clearly where we had work to do. That was the voice of Mitch Landrieu, former mayor of New Orleans, speaking of how the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina reveals the extent of the city's problems and the dire need for a rethink of its social and physical infrastructure. Okay, I'm not going to subject you to hearing all about the resilience of, of New Orleans. Um, but just in terms of the feedback and how the students got on, they did a really good job. They did assign themselves different tasks. I was quite amazed I didn't get any email saying, I have no idea what we're doing. How do you, how do you make a podcast? They figured all of that out. Um, and in terms of their feedback at the, I, I looked it up, they, they gave it a 4.67 for the assignments, not was for all the assignments, but they seemed to seem to enjoy it. I did get feedback that this was an enjoyable assignment and they saw that it was useful. Um, so from my perspective, it was surprisingly smooth. Um, it was a bit of a, a gamble because as I say, I'm not sure that I would know how to make a podcast, but there's so many um, supports online. The students had no problem with it. Thanks so much, Philip. The, that was really interesting and, and very insightful. Um, so like I mentioned, we'll we'll save questions and answers for, for the chat and perhaps for after the, the various presentations. Um, uh, at this point, our, I'll invite Arturo uh, to, to, um, to speak next. So Arturo is going to talk a little bit about his experience of using Poll Everywhere. Uh, as, as a method of, of uh, feedback. Um, so over to you, Arturo. Thank you, Jennifer. Well, this is something that uh, came uh, during confinement. I wanted to improve the interaction between students. Uh, I wanted them to talk among themselves and um, more or less I, I knew how I wanted to do it. So I wanted to organize a competition so I would break the class into teams, uh, maximum six students. And uh, well, at that time we were using Zoom and I would send them to different breakout uh, Zoom rooms. And the next step would be to look for the software, obviously a student response system that would be, uh, would be available uh, for me to implement this. And I started by checking usually, and then I noted uh, but, uh, well, we, was, uh, we have the subscription for Poll Everywhere. So we have access to all the features from Poll Everywhere. And one of the options of Poll Everywhere is to organize a competition, just what I wanted. So I'm gonna show you now uh, how Poll Everywhere looks like. It's, it's very similar to any other uh, student response system you might have used, uh, like Socrative or whatever. Um, and one thing I like about Port Everywhere is that you learn it in less than one hour. So in less than one hour, I was able to organize my, the competition, the questions and the whole thing is very straightforward. So you can see here how it looks from our perspective, uh, you know, so in step one, you log in with your uh, email address. You don't even need to uh, provide a password because then you're gonna have, in step two, you can see here, you have a, a prompt and you just click on login with University College Dublin and you go, uh, directly into the interface. So if you go to step three, uh, you go to activity, you see the blue button in the um, yes uh, upper left corner. When I click there, you go to step four and you have all the options there. So you can read at the very top, multiple choice, word cloud, questions and answer, clickable image. 
There are another two rows below, but the one I pick is the one competition. So it's the last icon in the top row. And then I just, just provide the name of the competition. And then when you see a one there, you uh, enter your first question. And these are, uh, you add the number of options uh, for the answer. And, and then you can add more questions. So you go to step five. So you can see, you, I can enter for the question, I can upload images or I can just provide tests or both. And there are a few options I can set up for the competition. So we are again in step five in competition settings. I can restrict the participants. So that means that they need to log in through a poll everywhere, providing a password. So I know who is who. But the way I did it is I just did it the most simple way. So I didn't restrict it. I just provided a web address and, and the students just needed to go to that web address to play. Another option is the option that they can change answers. So the answer here is going to be time. So for example, if you get your answer accurate and, and fast enough, you're going to get 1,000 points. Uh, if you get it accurate, but you're not so fast, you're going to get 900 or 800. But uh, well, accuracy, uh, speed will never make up for accuracy because if you get it wrong, you just get zero points. So in the next option there, uh, I've used timer. I'm going to set up the time I provide to each question in seconds, so typically. Uh, I will have one of this, one round of the competition every week. So it would be around between 10 and 15 questions. Um, I wanted to keep it dynamic. So each question would be around uh, three minutes. So you can see here in step six, six, how it looks like. So here I have, what well, you can see there are four questions. You have obviously signal the one that is correct for options. And then in step six, you can see, uh, step seven, uh, you can see, you can also obtain reports of uh, the answers uh, they provided, uh, the ones uh, they were right or, or wrong, and, and you can focus on those questions that uh, were poorest to go over them and, and explain them better. So now we're going to move to the next slide, uh, Jennifer, please. And this is what the students look like. So to enter the competition is very simple. They just go to the, this web address that you've seen in step one, uh, polev.com, and then that's, and this is my. Uh, web address or to the 1680, they click join. Then in a step two, they identify themselves. In this case, they were working in groups of maximum six, so they identify themselves with the name of a team. So this is managed just by one person in the team, which is the captain, who also must moderate the discussion uh, between the team and the one that provide the final answer. I would rotate the captain every week, so the responsibility would be lying on a different student every week. So in step three, you can see here, they're waiting for me to click just the play button on the competition, which appears in, the, in one of the interfaces in the previous slide. So once I click the play button in step four, they see the name of the competition. And it's a very small font size here, but it's the number of questions of that day. So then they go into number five. So that would be the first question. So the question appears in the left side, and then they have four options here, four matrices. In step six, you can see they have selected the first option, but they can actually go to the last option, which is clear uh, the response, and they can change their mind within the allocated time. So we're going to see now um, um, soon a, a video. This is how the interface looks like in, in step seven. So you can see here there is a clock. So if we go to the next slide, uh, something happened there. I, I cannot see. So to play your video, uh, Arturo, I need to uh, ah, okay. come to the PowerPoint is it, is it? view. Uh, yeah. So sorry, bear bear with me a second. Um, I want to share uh, PowerPoint. Um, so. Can you see my screen uh, if I start playing the video? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. So you can see there, this is the classification. And then after one question, and then the next question comes along. Um, this is how it looks like. And they're going to get a, uh, you have the question, the figure in the left side at the top, the text of the question, the four options. And um, well, this is how it looks when I project it on the screen in class. Uh, they have a different, we have one more option, which is clear the response or, or submit. And you can see the clock, 104, uh, coming down here. And if you go now to around two, uh, the minute to two and 15 seconds, yes, that's okay, 217. Yes, okay, that's fine, leave it there, so zero. 
Another going to see what the right answer was. So they did not too well in this one, which is the first one. And they're going to see this was the last question. So when is the last question of the day? Well, you have a bit of confetti around, and they can see the final uh, classification for the teams. So I would keep an, a classification for the day, and then I would add all the points. So uh, they would have an overall classification at the end of the six weeks. I would use this only as formative assessment, not as grades. That was only a, a chance for the students to discuss the, the topics of the, of the course. And, uh, and that's it. Uh, yeah. That's magnificent. Yes. Thank you. Arturo, thank you so much. Um, that's, that's really interesting. Um, uh, so, so at this point, uh, we, we'll, we'll move on to, to the next speaker. Um, hopefully you can see my screen again. So I'm now going to invite Shane to talk for a couple of minutes. So Shane has been using Google Forms uh, quite substantially in, in, in his teaching. Um, so Shane, I'll, I'll hand over to you at this point. Yeah, thanks, Jen. And just apologies, I've been trying to fix my camera for the last 20 minutes. I don't know what's going on with it. Obviously not a great start, uh, I'll admit, for someone trying to demonstrate some form of uh, online technology, but uh, I'll keep going for now if that's okay anyway. Um, I don't think you need to see me. Um, yeah, so as Jen, Jen says, I'm going to talk about using Google Forms um, as a mechanism for managing peer review, uh, which really is quite straightforward and, and maybe quite a bit less technologically advanced than some of the others um, that we've seen already today, and I think we're gonna see uh, later on as well. Um, but I think it meet Jen's, meets Jen's criteria in that it's something that I implemented during lockdown um, that I found useful uh, in the long term, and that's something I'm using from now on as well. So obviously a big issue with group work uh, can be an understanding or understanding what students really did what, uh, particularly for larger and more valuable pieces of coursework. And obviously if we assign an overall group mark, it can, be, it, it can encourage passengers, <laughs> uh, which obviously can be unfair on, on more active group members. Um, who end up doing quite a large bit uh, maybe of the coursework that's assigned. So over the last couple of years, for a couple of my modules, I've implemented a peer review element, um, really just to better understand individual student input. Uh, and I do use that then to inform my marking. Uh, yeah, so one of these modules, uh, the, 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 one of my modules, Geotechnics 4, uh, it has a six week long uh, bit of coursework. It's worth 35% of the overall module marks. And again, not to give you too much information because you probably don't need to know, but just a little bit of background to what the actual coursework is. Uh, so basically, it's geotechnics. The, the, the students are given a greenfield site uh, and asked to design the foundations uh, for a couple of structures, um, but they're only given some very basic information and they're given a budget of 20,000 20, uh, euro to commission a site investigation. Uh, so I give them a price list for a range of different methods for testing you know, in situ ground conditions for drilling boreholes, for taking samples, doing lab tests. I have a kind of a large, I've generated over the years, a kind of a large cloud of data. And they, they ask for various forms of or whatever information they require uh, from various parts of the site. And then I provide that for them then. Uh, now, to make, I would like at some point to make that digitally, um, to, to, to do that online, actually, to make some form of online version of this. But right now, it's fairly manual in how I approach it. Um, so basically, yeah, they make all of the decisions from the very start of the site investigation process right through to design. Um, and there's loads of potential geohazards on site as well, which, which, which make it all quite interesting. Uh, and in terms of peer review, sorry, Jen, if you just go back one slide again, I haven't jumped on. So on the right hand side there, so it is, is the form I would have I would have got the students to fill in in the past. Uh, so they basically would have, have completed a hard copy of this particular form. Uh, it worked fine, um, but combining, I guess, uh, analyzing the information wasn't, wouldn't have been straightforward as you have to cross-reference all of these separate forms uh, for each of the students. So it was a kind of a cumbersome process. Uh, so next slide, please, Jen. Uh, so yeah, so obviously 2020 lockdown happened. Everything was forced online. Um, and I could have done this at the time over email uh, or maybe via Brightspace, uh, but I had some discussions with Fiacra, uh, who was doing something similar. Uh, and he suggested I try to implement it um, in Google Forms. So I gave it a go. Uh, and it, it probably took a few increments to get it right, I suppose. But um, yeah, so basically you can see one of the forms here or part of one of them where students are just asked a series of questions on who contributed to the various aspects of the work. So three being a leading contribution, 
two being, uh, or, or sorry, zero being maybe no contribution and the spectrum obviously in between from the site investigation part to design part, which you're seeing now. And if Jen clicks on again, you'll see there's obviously an overall report writing and editing part as well. Uh, and then our, there's also, I provide an option for some additional commentary if it's needed, which actually all the students tend to do that uh, to justify their various contributions, which obviously is good. Again, it gives me more information. Next slide, please, Jen. Uh, and then the forms uh, output the data directly into a spreadsheet, like you see this here. Again, those of you who will have used Google Forms will obviously be, have, have, have seen these kinds of spreadsheets. Uh, and some of the fields I've just shown here, but again, it does give you a strong sense of who did what. So on the right-hand side then for the foundation design, for example, you can see that student three and four obviously took that element on board. See, so there's more threes and twos there. Whereas maybe the data interpretation was more done by the first couple of students uh, and then the first two fields there, the investigation, were probably done broadly as they should be in a kind of a group discussion by all students. Uh, and again, I suppose then, so for the main benefit for me is rather than having to cross-reference all the individual forms, uh, which took a bit of time, uh, all of the information is immediately available in the spreadsheet. It's much easier to analyse. Uh, yes, there's a bit of a planning and setup time, but not that much, to be honest with you. And it's, it's overall, it saved me quite a bit of time. And it's something I'm using um, and implementing as we speak. Thanks, Jen. Jane. Thank you so much. I think that's really useful because um, this, there's so much that can be done with Google Forms. It's so versatile and, and relatively easy, uh, easy to use. Um, so, so it's fantastic to see it in, in that application. Um, so uh, moving on, um, I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes um, about what I did in the flipped classroom context um, in terms of blended learning. So for those that may or may not be uh, familiar with the term flipped classroom, um, the, the traditional classroom as we know it uh, was the face-to-face -face, uh, the le lecturer doing lots of, of talking and explaining. Um, and and uh, this, this other idea, this flipped classroom idea is, is using that time with students uh, on activities in the classroom, uh, rather than students sitting and, and listening, listening passively. Um, so, so it's the idea of uh, introducing homework activities and classroom activities uh, that, that minimizes um, the passive element of, of student learning and maximizes their, their engagement. Uh, so, so in my uh, couple of slides, uh, I've used these colour coded icons. So activities that I would give students before they come to my class, those things that they will do during class and then what happens afterwards. And I'm going to give two examples uh, in, 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 in this way. Uh, so one of them is, is in relation to guest experts. Uh, so I have a large group of students uh, and they are working on a design project. Half of the class are architecture students and the other half are engineering students. Um, so the, the students are broken up into small groups and they are working to develop the structural engineering scheme of one of the architects studio designs. Um, and one of the things that worked extremely well in the online context was to bring in guest experts uh, from different parts of Ireland and different parts of the world um, to give feedback to students on, on their work to date. So before this uh, session with the experts, students were expected to prepare their design up to a draft stage and to, to prepare some questions they might ask the, guests, the experts uh, and, and to really think about what, uh, what and how they might uh, engage in the session. Um, so then during the live session, it was run in Zoom using breakout rooms. And uh, there's no way that I would have been able to get the number or the caliber of experts that I was able to bring to the session only for the fact that it was online and so much more easily accessible uh, to, to the experts than if they had to physically come and travel to the campus. Uh, it, it cost them less time. Um, so we had a, a, a schedule for the afternoon. Um, there was an introduction and then uh, each group of students 
uh, got three or four consultations with three or four different experts that all happened in breakout rooms. Um, so it was kind of like a round robin experience. Um, and then afterwards, uh, I asked students to summarize what they learned, what feedback they got uh, from experts, what changes they plan to make to their designs before submitting it uh, in its final form. And the feedback from both students and the experts uh, was phenomenally positive and, and incredibly encouraging, uh, so, such that we intend to, to run it in a similar way again in coming years. The second example that I wanted to mention uh, was around model making. So uh, we have a laser cutter in the civil engineering labs um, and I uh, engage students in their groups to build a physical model of that design that they're working on. So before this activity, um, I, I invite students to work through a series of YouTube tutorials on AutoCAD, I, and not all students will be familiar with AutoCAD. Students are advised that they'll have two sheets of birch ply material to work with, and they're expected to draw the elements of their building in 2D, uh, and these will be cut using the laser cutter from their sheets of birch ply. So there's a substantial amount of work that students uh, will do before uh, the actual activity in class um, and, and students are asked to upload their CAD file uh, to a shared Google Drive folder uh, and this folder is shared with the lab technicians in the lab um, who uh, uh, cut, uh, use the laser cutter and cut the materials in advance of students coming uh, to, to, the, to the construction session. Um, so even in the uh, height of restrictions, where we were only allowed very limited on-campus activity, um, uh, it meant that students were able to come to campus in very small groups, work in a socially distanced way, and assemble their physical models. Um, and again, the, the, the feedback here was enormously positive. Students were so delighted uh, to, to be able to do this physically in person. And it gave them a much greater understanding of uh, the, the not just modeling at, at small scale, but the process of turning a design into something that, that's structurally stable uh, and will stand up. Um, so, so that's um, that's the the end of what I'm going to mention today. Um, I'd be delighted to take any questions in chat or later that, that anybody might have. Um, this is something that I'll definitely be retaining in in its modified form going forward. As as a, as I think I found and students found it, it worked much more efficiently than than the way I used to run it uh, pre pandemic. So. Um, Next, I'm going to invite Porik, uh, Porik Carroll, uh, to speak a little bit about uh, table quizzes and, and what he did uh, in, in this space during lockdown. So over to you, Porik. Thanks, Jen. So um, this is slightly different because the application I first used it in was slightly more informal than a class-based uh, application. So we, I, we ran a quiz uh, back in May 2020 uh, as a kind of a social event at the end of the semester as we usually have um, a tag rugby game for staff and students uh, every year in civil engineering. So this year, as everything was uh, in lockdown, we um, decided to run a quiz online. And uh, since using the applications that I used in this quiz, I found that there's actually other ways in which they could be used and applied to teaching. And um, so I used two different applications. Uh, so Jen, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, two different applications uh, running kind of in conjunction with each other. With each other. So, the, when designing the quiz, I was trying to de f decide and find a way in which I could use breakout rooms, but also share um, the quiz uh, questions and also uh, a camera at the same time. So, um, what I found is that um, many, I suppose, YouTube creators actually use this tool called Screen Streamlabs, uh, which is quite a useful tool for in many different ways so you can actually um, use many different inputs and uh, kind of modify and um, choose what different inputs you want to show on the screen at the one time so you can show your camera in one one area of the screen you can also share slides 
if you want to go through a problem um, such as a sketch or an application or go through a, um, an equation, you can share this all on one screen and, and modify it accordingly. So um, I find it very useful for kind of um, for that for that purpose, but also you can use it in ways in which, uh, such as um, you know, running a an online module um, that would require pre pre recorded lectures, um, but also running group work um, and also um, showing the showing the um, the exam or the assessment in a different screen. So the way this ran was that um, the, the 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 actual quiz itself. Was live streamed on YouTube, um, and that was uh, connected up with this tool called Streamlabs. And then this, each individual team then were able to discuss uh, in their own teams using breakout rooms, so that they could discuss the questions and the answers um, privately, um, while the, the the quiz was actually being live streamed elsewhere. And um, in that live stream, um, you know, it could go through the questions themselves, but also uh, make it a bit more interactive and not just uh, have to go through slides. So, um, you know, since since then, I've kind of looked into it a bit further and seen ways in which it could be applied to teaching. So um, I found that, you know, uh, for pre-recorded lectures, um, you could, it, it is very useful for um, modifying and making it a bit more professional. So if you are using, um, for example, a green screen, um, or if you want to make a more professional online module, that you may see many different creators um, uh, using. It's very useful for that purpose and um, to uh, bring in different inputs in real time. Um, and then you can also modify it afterwards. Um, so yeah, for that purpose, I found it very useful. Um, and um, I suppose uh, there's a lot more to it than I've used so far, but um, I definitely recommend it for for this purpose, um, as it, everyone's, everyone's very familiar with YouTube, and it integrates seamlessly, seamlessly with that, but also with Zoom. So if you want to uh, integrate with Zoom or, or, or YouTube, um, there is that functionality to do so. So uh, just a very quick, br brief uh, overview of that uh, is what the purpose of this um, talk was. So thanks. Thanks very much, Porik. And, and I think it's probably worth mentioning that many of us in the school took inspiration from what you did and recreated it in, in our own ways. Um, I, I, so, some of us, uh, you know, with family table quizzes over Christmas and, and, and others in, in the classroom. So, uh, so it, it, what you did here in, in figuring out how to do this has been enormously beneficial to, to many of us. Um, so then uh, our, our last speaker uh, this morning will be Daniel McCrum. Um, and Daniel's going to speak a little bit about um, large class engagement um, and, and how effective um, he found and we found breakout rooms on Zoom uh, for this. So without further ado, Dan, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thanks, Jen. Y yeah, just, I suppose, a bit of background, really. Uh, I didn't put any background, but th this is a module myself and Jen to stage one students. We have about 160 students. Um, and during lockdown, we went obviously on Zoom and everything. And um, I suppose the, the point of this is that I, since going back teaching face-to-face, -face, I haven't taught this module face-to-face -face yet because it's this trimester, but based on my experience of going back face-to-face -face in other modules, there's aspects from Zoom that I'm going to retain in this module because it worked so well. And, and one of those, um, when you have a class of 160, and I know, I'm quite tight on time here, actually, because we've, we've only a few minutes left, so I'll be quite quick. But I think, found with 160 students, when you're delivering lecture live, even, and you get a certain number of students who will engage, and that's about it. You know, the rest just don't feel comfortable doing it. But on Zoom, you can use the chat functions. And one of the things I, you're all probably aware of this anyway, but one of the things is the private chat and the public chat to everyone. So if you highlight that students can send you a message privately, you can then just repeat that message. And I found significantly higher volumes of questions during lecture time. So Jennifer has mentioned um, flipped classrooms. So she does that on this module. She teaches for six weeks and I teach for six weeks. Um, uh, and the delivering of um, the module lecture content I found in particular, uh, I believe worked better on Zoom with such a large class. Okay, so next slide, please, Jen. Um, I, I would also say uh, what I found, even with smaller classes, but, but especially with larger classes, you were able to gauge 
their understanding and how much they've absorbed the content knowledge using the, the polls. Um, so Arturo has obviously gone into something much more detailed around polls, but what I found was structuring the lecture, uh, the online lecture around a couple of polls helped really well in terms of, okay, well, I need to go back and repeat this. Whereas I found teaching this face-to-face -face in the past, students just pretend that they understand everything and you move on. Um, I would say in this module, we do a lot of um, active learning content. And um, this module has a double lecture on Mondays, uh, which myself and Jen tend to use for the active content. And my plan in the future would have just been to do the, on Tuesday mornings, we have a single lecture. My, my plan based on using Zoom and going back face to face would be to retain that Tuesday morning lecture uh, as an online lecture, because I, I believe it worked better, you know. Um, so yeah, yeah, and I always find, you know, it was better on Zoom that, you know, you, you're asking open questions and only a handful of students respond, but on Zoom you get much greater response. Uh, okay, one last slide, yeah. The, the, the caveats, I suppose, and, and I know Philip mentioned this, he, I forget the name of what they used, but we, I know myself and Jen trying to use Jamboard as well. And we had one student who did X's and O's the whole time. Um, so, and he ruined it, or she ruined it, or they ruined it, whoever it was. Um, so I like the fact that you could see who the people were uh, on Phillips who was actually putting in the content, because then would probably stop that. What I felt was the breakout rooms for such large classes, um, uh, they worked well, but the face-to-face -face will work much better for that. So I don't intend to use the breakout rooms in that respect. The other thing we found with using the such a large class um, and the breakout rooms was that if you didn't use a UCD Zoom account, we had to add them in manually and that took forever. Um, so that really slowed things up. Um, I also found that the breakout rooms that if you have smaller classes, you can jump into the breakout rooms, you have time to do that. But with the large class, you know, we had um, 23 or four groups in of five students. You just weren't able to engage with the students. So, you know, there's aspects of Zoom that I thought worked really well and will continue to use, but there's aspects that didn't work so well um, going forward. Okay, thank you.